also that maintain that they're still truth telling because what you know there's a that is that to me is a real challenge with something like this because you've got one journey that starts with one motivation which is your dear friend Tim Hetherington and, and sitting in that 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 story of just describe that for a second the film starts with that with that kind of gambit of 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 him in the train with you yeah I mean so Tim Tim was uh, my good friend and brother and colleague that I, I made my film Restrepo, with, our film Restrepo with, about American soldiers on an outpost in Eastern Afghanistan. And, you know, we, it was self-financed. We did the whole thing ourselves. And, uh, you know, when we were, go we were going down to Washington DC to talk to National Geographic to see if they would buy our film. And we were, took the train down there and on, you know, on the way down, you know, it's two and a half hours. And I spent the whole time staring out the window because, you know, I just love what I what you can see out of train window and and you know halfway through and Tim was always filming everything right and I mean he was constantly filming things and and at one point I said Tim man you know and he happened to have been filming then for some reason I, I, I said filming me I, you know I don't know why but he said uh, I said you know we could walk this whole railroad line from DC to New York we could have walked the whole darn thing like you know there's dirt bike trails and maintenance roads and cornfields and ghettos and whatever, we could walk this whole thing. We could sleep out most of it. Like we should do that. And, and, uh, and he said, yeah. And then someone will in the future, someone will find the footage in the future after everything has changed. And it was just chilling when I found that on his hard drive, because I made a film about Tim after he was killed in Libya. And I found that footage. I was like, Oh man, we didn't know that everything when you said that everything had changed, that meant your death. Like we didn't know that. You didn't know that when you said that. And that's what changed. And so I took that bit of footage and started my film, The Last Patrol, about our trek that I took with these other guys. And one of them, Guillermo Cervera, this amazing Spanish photographer, was in the back of the rebel pickup truck with my friend Tim as Tim bled out on the way to the Misrata hospital. He was standing near Tim when Tim got hit by shrapnel. And he was holding my best friend's hand as he died. And I got to you know Guillermo partly because I wanted to know what had happened. And some of that brotherhood just transferred from Tim to Guillermo. And, you know, we'll, we, we'll, we will be lifelong friends, brothers. Mm. I find it fascinating because it was one experience on the railroad that could take two very different um, forms, um, both art forms and also the way that you explore um, explore thought at a different stage in your career, if you like, in a different stage of you as a human being. And um, the fact that such a large period of time has elapsed between the two, I think is very, um, anybody that's listening, I urge you, if you can, to watch the HBO because it's, uh, it's very liberating about how, how experience can be interpreted in, in, in so many different ways with time and, and, and with the written word. This just, you don't have this same, this same structural kind of rigor that you have to have with a film, whereas, you know, what's the jeopardy? You got me in the first two minutes. It's like the book writing does something else. Um, and I found, it, I found that fascinating, um, how the two can be experienced side by side, but they by no means means um, um, echo the same ideas um, um, at all um, and um, so anyway I urge those that can to try and to try and watch that film The Last Patrol. Um, before we move on to questions we've got about 15 minutes of questions at the end um, I would like to ask you you've you, your various books War which dealt, dealt with how men fight, Tribe with what happens when soldiers come home, Freedom less less conflict you know huge topic in 150 pages it seems like you've almost given up talking about conflict as such but what next? Um, what, these these sort of single word, huge themes, um, economically told. Tell me, what's your next one going to be? Um, you know, I love writing, and I choose my topics for which topics will allow me to enjoy the writing and to write well, to write powerfully. And um, so, I, I think. Um, for the first time in my life, I think I'll, I'll be writing about something because it happened to me, um, which is that I almost died last year. I had a, um, an undiagnosed asymptomatic aneurysm in my pancreatic artery. It had been there my whole life, it, it, uh, or it developed throughout my lifetime. It was a congenital deformity, basically, very rare. And I, um, 
right in the middle of us, I mean, I'm talking to someone, like I'm talking to you, I felt a stab of pain in my abdomen and it was the artery finally rupturing. And I lost almost all my blood into my abdominal cavity. I, I lost 90% of my blood. And it took me over an hour to get to the hospital. And, um, you know, I had something that kills almost everybody. I mean, almost no one survives this. And I somehow, I have two little girls, a four-year-old and a one and a half year old. And I don't know if that kept me alive. I don't know. I didn't know I was dying, but I was. And um, the very last moments as I was really going, uh, a black hole opened up underneath me and I started to get pulled down into it. And the doctor, right, it was in the, the doctor was in the middle of cutting open my neck to try to get a, a large gauge line into my, into my neck. So to give enough, give me enough blood fast enough to save my life. And, uh, and right then, as I was in this twilight zone, um, my, my dead father appeared. He was a physicist. My dead father appeared and started comforting me. And, uh, I remember I wanted to have nothing to do with him. I mean, he was on the other side, you know, and, um, the last thing I remember saying to the doctor was, you gotta, you gotta hurry up. You're losing me right now. And they, they, they did it. They saved me. And so I, I want to write a book called pulse about what keeps us alive. Cause it's a miracle that any of us are alive, you know, that, that we exist. I mean, the whole thing's a miracle. So I, I want to write about this physical miracle of, of, of being, of existing, of being alive. And, uh, and, and about what happens when you die, the, the, the visions that people have when they die are honestly, they're hard to explain. And I know I'm, an, I'm not religious. I want to understand them in, in real terms, not mythic terms. And, um, you can, there's a, there's some explanations like ketamine, you know, endogenous ketamine and DMT and low oxygen in the brain and all this stuff that can give you weird hallucinations. You can do that to people who aren't dying and they don't see their dead ancestors. Dead ancestors show up when you're dying. And um, that, I want to understand that. I want to explain it because it's universal. And it, it really, there is no explanation. Mm, really, that's quite something. And that happened during the writing of this book? Yeah, I just, I just finished Run and printed it out. And I was looking forward to rereading it with a pen and, uh, you know, un underlining stuff that had to be changed or whatever. And one afternoon, at the end of the day, I just felt a stab in my stomach. And I so within within minutes, I couldn't stand up. Within 10 minutes, I was going blind. And you know, an, hour, an hour later, my dead father was talking to me. Do you think this one will be written in the I voice? <laughs> I think I may finally be forced to write in the first person, <laughs> yes. I'll try to do it with humility and without too much of a, too much unseemly interest in my own affairs. <laughs> well, I love, love, love being in the pages of a kind of a travel book that doesn't make me um, go into somebody's biography so deep that I get bored by page 10. So thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, but we've got some questions that are beginning to come in. Um, this is um, from Gavin Smith. Um, Sebastian, do you do anything in your everyday life to protect your freedoms? Good question. I mean, my, you know, my, my freedom comes from the fact that I, I live in a country that can defend itself, uh, but that also tries to maintain a fairly egalitarian society. There's a long way to go. You know, there is very clear racial and economic injustice in this country um, that we have to work on. But our freedom comes from our Bill of Rights and our Constitution. And, and we have to make sure that our society and our government respects those. Um, our freedom comes from the fact that there are peaceful transfers of power and that a bunch of thugs can't invade the seat of our democracy in, in, in the US Capitol and try to change the out, outcome of an election. Like that's where our freedom comes from. Um, I would say that what, what do I do every day? Um, I think about myself as a participant in this country and that I owe it something. And when it needs me, I hope I can serve it well. In the meantime, I vote, I give blood and I serve on jury duty. And if we all did all of those things, we would be absolutely guaranteed a free country. And, and, and I, wish, I wish it was more like that. There's something that you talk about in the book, and I'm just going to read this little paragraph because it's um, it's a. I found it 
I find it very powerful. We'd each dug our own beds out of the slope so we could sleep without rolling into the river. And we were strung along the bank like linked sausages. The fire embers still pulsed and the night was soft and benevolent. And it felt like summer waited for us a few days upriver. My dog lay on my ankles and the three other men shifted and muttered next to me in their sleep. There may be better things than that, but not many. That really resonated because it was really about the freedom that comes from simplicity, from the freedom of stripping back in a country that you also describe these great sort of these tr freight trains that run for two, three minutes with just, you know, the American consumer <laughs> freight train passing through. Have you, I want to just extend Gavin's question there, which is, have you found yourself living more simply as a result of this journey and stripping back to that sort of almost that backpack that you describe? Yeah, I mean, I do live indoors and I have a family. And, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, uh, yeah, but, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the thing about capitalism is that it, it sort of almost requires everyone to devote a third of their life to working. And then you have the, you know, the, hopefully you have enough money to buy all the stuff that capitalism offers you that look fun or essential or whatever. And I, I you know, I try to keep, I mean, if nothing, if for no other reason than I hate the idea of all this plastic going into a landfill, I just try not to buy stuff. You know, we have two young girls and we just, I mean, the amount of cheap stuff you can buy for children is just appalling. And I, you know, I just try, we try to keep it simple. We don't, you know, I mean, we all, you know, we all, the family sleeps in on the floor in one room all together. We don't have cradles. We don't have a separate room for the kids. Like we don't have baby strollers. We don't, we, you know, we try to raise our children in a way that humans have done for a hundred, a hundred thousand years, you know, without all these overpriced gadgets that liberate the parent, but are really not that great for the child, you know? So there's a million ways to maintain your autonomy. And that means for me, maintaining your autonomy means maintaining healthy human connections for the people closest to you. And 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 be, however you de, whoever you determine this, being sober, sober-minded, you know, we don't own a television because I don't want to get sucked into a sort of an addiction to like entertainment. Um, and uh, you know, I, I don't drink, uh, and I did some I did some great drinking when I was young. I got to say, and I'm glad I did. But right now, I you know I just don't want to be connect. I don't I don't I don't want to be dependent on something, addicted to something. You know, back to Gavin's point, you know, how do you maintain your freedom every day? Make sure you are not addicted to anything, right? Just for starters, like whatever that whatever that may be. And uh, you know, addictions are often a solution to another problem. I mean, I used to be addicted to exercise, right? I was a long distance runner. I ran 100 miles a week for all kinds of convoluted psychological reasons. But those solutions become their own problem. They become their own addiction, right? And so, you know, you just have to be very cautious about that. That's very interesting. We've got. Uh... Oh, a question from Carmen, um, who's, um, I'm sorry, Carmen, your husband's very ill right now, and you've asked about some of the advice that you can give her family. They've got two sons, and I suppose that's really a question about um, where the value lay in this journey and what you, what, what you would never want to lose. Yeah. I'm, Carmen, I'm very, very sorry to hear that for you and your family. Um, I know after what happened to me that my overwhelming concern wasn't for my own, for what, it wasn't for my own mortality. D -d Dying, I realized, because I was right on the edge of it. It was a small step to the left. It wasn't a big deal. I realized it really was not a big deal. It was a big deal in the context of what my family would go through. And I would say, I hope your husband gets better. But what I would say is that I'm guessing his primary concern is for you all. And you don't, you may not have to take care of him in that sense. He wants to know that you guys are going to be okay. And I can say that with almost something close to certainty because I was in that exact same position for a little while. And my anguish had nothing to do with me. It had to do with my little girls and, and how would they, what, if they would be okay, you know? And I needed to know that they would be okay no matter what. And I said to my wife one night, listen, if something happens to me and I die, you have, you, you have to promise me not to 
be worried about me. I'm fine. I'm dead. The entire concern is for the girls and for you. That's the only thing I want you thinking about. Your husband very well may be thinking those same thoughts. And um, they, it's really important to heed them. It's something actually, which I'm Carmen, I'm glad you brought up um, a, a female perspective apart from anything else here, because the role of women in the pursuit of freedom is something that you do talk about in the book and, um, and, uh, and powerfully. Could you just perhaps talk about that for a, for a couple of minutes, Sebastian? and about the kind of the marginality of the female story you tell, but how powerful it becomes. Yeah, I mean, so first of all, every society has a gender division of labor, labor and in every society, um, including this one, uh, Western society, um, the bulk of childcare is false to the women. And at, at maybe as a result, Women are very, very good at um, constructing social support networks amongst themselves and in society. I mean, one could say that if men just defend society, women keep it together. And if either one doesn't happen, um, no one survives. And, you know, all oh, that's changing. There's women in the military, all oh, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I get it. But for most of human history, men have been charged with the majority of defense, you know, spear in hand, and women have been charged with keeping the society together and, and basically it being a, something worth living for, living in, right? And so any effort for freedom that does not have women participating in it vigorously, vigorously really almost isn't worth winning, right? I mean, if the women aren't on board for the society you're trying to create, what are you, what are you doing guys? What are you, you know, what, you know, what are you bothering for? Like, but you know, in, on a more sort of tactical level, um, women are incredibly effective in these uh, sort of social justice fights, right? For a couple of reasons. One is that women are great at lateral social networks. I mean, men are great at top down pyramids sort of hierarchies where the top guy says, okay, now you will run into machine gun fire or we will run into machine gun fire. And the guys do it, right? They're really, really good at that kind of top-down hierarchy. And women are really, not that they can't do that, but they're, they're really good at this other thing, which are lateral social networks, which are very hard for the authorities to penetrate. And so the, the, the labor movement in Massachusetts, in the, in the textile mills, you know, around 100 years ago, they started using women as a means of, of, uh, of transmitting information and the authorities could not penetrate it. And then they, then they started putting women on the front line in the strikes. And so the national guards, you know, these 19 year old boys with like fixed bayonets confronting the striking, the striking mill workers, all of a sudden what they're confronting is women on the front line. They didn't know what to do, right? But the authorities, even quite brutal authorities are a little more reluctant to kill women en masse in public, right? And so that, so one police captain said this wonderful thing. I quote in my book, it's one of my favorite quotes. He said, one good cop can handle 10 men, but it takes 10 cops to handle one woman, right? And with that, they changed the dynamic on the streets and it allowed the, the mill workers, it helped allow the mill workers to win that fight. So, you know, women are crucial, absolutely crucial to any, any effort towards freedom and any effort towards a just society. Well, thanks for talking about that, Sebastian, because I think if anybody gets a sense of what this book is beyond the absolute razor sharp prose, which anyone that's a writer or appreciates good writing, just read it for that alone, please. But I really do hope you get a sense of the, some of these digressions that the book takes, takes you to places which are so universal and thought about from such an original place that it will stimulate a response that you will be digging back into that book to just try and process it some more for yourself, to form your own opinions about what freedom really means. And in that, Sebastian is true to what he says. Um, journalists don't give you um, conclusions. They, they give you new ways to think or they prompt you into new ways of thinking. So I sincerely thank you for your time for producing this. Um, little masterpiece, Freedom, 
And it's out now with Fourth Estate here in the UK. And um, thank you very much indeed. It's been a total pleasure to have had this on, on my desk for the last seven days. So thank you. So, Sophie, it was a real pleasure talking to you. I, I, I loved our conversation. And um, I was just thrilled that you liked the book so much. Thank you. Oh, properly, properly love it. And Dana, I'm passing back to you. Thank you both so much for such a wonderful conversation and joining us this evening. Um, and to everyone at home, thank you for joining Sophie and Sebastian. Um, we hope to see you again at a future How To Academy event. You can check out our calendar at howtoacademy.com. Um, enjoy the rest of your weekends.